Praise the Lord. So victory has been won. Let us pray. Let us bow our heads in humble adoration unto our King. Father, the Lord, we praise you today. We glorify you. We give you all the praise and the glory because you are worthy to be praised. How excellent is thy name. Lord, we give you victory today for we are here because of you, Lord, your righteousness, your healing in us, your forgiveness in us, and your encouragement always continually in our hearts, Lord. We pray for each family today, Lord. We bless them. Thank you, Father, for allowing them to be here today. Lord, even those who were not able to be on the line today, Lord, that are a part of your ministry, Lord, and those who aren't, Father, help us, Lord Jesus, to give you all praise and glory as we pray to you, Father, for each and every soul, Lord. We pray that some soul may be saved today, Lord, by the word that is ministered to us today by our pastor, Father Jesus. We pray that you're healing for those who are sick, healing for those who are grieving, Lord. Lord, let your kingdom come, your saving grace. Oh, what would we do if we did not have you? So Lord, have your way in the service, Lord Jesus. Camp your angels around us, Father. May the songs, may the prayers, may everything, Lord, that has breath, give you praise, glory, and honor. We love you with all of our hearts and all of our souls. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the sovereign God. Walk before me and be blameless. Then I will confirm my covenant between me and you, and I will give you a multitude of descendants. Abram bowed down with his face to the ground, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer will your name be Abram. Instead, your name will be Abraham, because I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will descend from you. I will confirm my covenant as a perpetual covenant between me and you. It will extend to your descendants after you throughout their generations. I will be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Romans chapter four, verses 13 through 21. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would inherit the world was not fulfilled through the law, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if they became heirs by the law, faith is empty and the promise is nullified. For the law brings wrath because where there is no law, there is no transgression either. For this reason, it is by faith so that it may be by grace, with the result that the promise may be certain to all the descendants, not only to those who are under the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He is our father in the presence of God, whom he believed, the God who makes the dead alive, and summons the things that do not yet exist as though they already do. Against hope, Abraham believed in hope with the result that he became the father of many nations. According to the pronouncement, so will your descendants be. Without being weak in faith, he considered his own body as dead because he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver in unbelief about the promise of God, but was strengthened in faith, 
giving glory to God. He was fully convinced that what God promised, he was also able to do. Praise the Lord. We thank you for your generous tithes and offering. We ask that you would continue to give and we ask that you would continue to pray for our community. Uh, this morning, our special prayers are going out for Texas and restoration and recovery and for uh, all of those that have been affected by adverse weather conditions. Let us pray. Great and awesome God, we gathered this morning to praise you, to lift you up, and to magnify your name. For you alone are worthy of the honor and the glory. God, we bring before you those that are in Texas, those that are in other parts of the world that have been affected by adverse weather conditions. Lord, we pray for restoration. We pray for the resources to uh, for restoration. We pray for recovery. God, we ask that uh, those in charge would, would generously give to those who are in need. Uh, God, this was a weather condition. And so, God, we just ask that, that um, the resources would be available for the people to rebuild and, and recover from this. God, we pray for our children, that are, some are in school, some are in hybrid and some are uh, learning at home. God, we just ask that you would be with them, be with the teachers, help them uh, to teach in such a way that the students want to learn. And Lord, press upon our students that they, the need and the want to, to learn. God, we just thank you for our children. We thank you for what you're doing in their lives. Lord, we pray for those that are sick and shut in, those that have been ill in body and in mind and in spirit. And God, we ask that you would renew their spirit. You would heal their body. God, we pray for those who are bereaved, mourning, and are grieved this morning. Lord, we pray for those that you would comfort them, that you would provide them with the resources that they need and the wisdom that they need. Surround them with the people that they need to have around them to help them to move forward. God, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you, God, that you are in the midst of this pandemic and you are making a difference. God, we thank you for your love, your care, your protection, and your provision. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Lord, we thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made, and we are rejoicing and are glad about it. Your word says that we can cast all of our cares and our concerns on you because you will take care of us. You will sustain us. And so, God, we can take our burdens to you and leave them there because we know that you will make a difference. And so, God, right now we ask that you would bless this word. Bless this moment. Lord, may you get the glory out of what is said. And may you be glorified. And may the devil be horrified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The demands of discipleship. The demands of discipleship. Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. The demands of discipleship. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory. And with the holy angels, Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38, NIV. Recently, we have focused on Jesus' power and authority to heal and deliver. And now we shift our attention to discipleship. Jesus' power and authority to heal and deliver was evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. Now we will explore what does it mean to be the Messiah? Messiah. What does it mean? What does that actually mean? Often, we are with Jesus' power and authority, but we shy away from suffering and death. In Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 5, it describes the Messiah. He was despised and rejected by mankind. He was a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. The Messiah will be rejected and will suffer death. So Mark turns our focus to the meaning of rejection and suffering. A disciple is a learner and a follower of Jesus Christ. And Jesus calls all of us to be disciples. A disciples learn Jesus' words and his way of ministry. A disciple imitates Jesus' life and character. A disciple makes more disciples by teaching others. Are you a disciple of Christ? What does discipleship look like 
amid COVID-19 and COVID-16-19. The body of Christ leads the people to the truth. Disciples get the facts about vaccine and plan ways for the underserved communities of color to receive the vaccine. Disciples run for office. They get involved in the community political affairs to bring about equity and fairness. Disciples become part of the solution. It is easy to sit on the sidelines and talk about what should and could be done and criticize those trying. Disciples are televising the revolution via Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and other social media sources. The school board, the county board, the city council needs disciples concerned about their neighbor's well-being. In the era of pandemics, discipleship is getting involved in being the change you want to see. Let's see what the text can teach us this morning. The text opens with, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that they must be killed and after three days rise again. Jesus refers to himself as a Son of Man. So there's a shift in the atmosphere. This is not a political title. This is not a religious title, but this is a title that says who Jesus is. He refers to himself as the Son of Man, and there's an atmospheric shift. Jesus is no longer proving that he is the Messiah, but he is now looking at what it means to be the Messiah. His miracles and deliverance Prove that he is the Messiah. The Son of Man, the Messiah, will go through rejection and death at the religious leaders' hands. The religious leaders will take Jesus out, but God will raise Jesus from the dead. Suffering, rejection, death, and resurrection are all within God's plans for Jesus' life here on earth. Peter, the unspoken, unofficial spokesperson for the disciples, takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. Jesus, Peter, unofficial spokesperson, takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. Peter may have spoken what they all were thinking but Jesus turned and looked at the disciples and rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Who are we? Who was Peter to rebuke the Son of God, the Christ? We may think that God's anointed can avoid suffering, rejection, and death, and that God's rule means power without pain, glory without humiliation, but we've got this Christianity thing all wrong. We will experience some suffering, trials, chaos, tribulation, confusion, and troubles. Let me remind you what Jesus said in John 16 and 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Being a Christian means you have an all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-present God on your side. It means God who cares will take care of you. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 34, verses 17 through 19, 
The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. We are going to make it through the darkness. Life is not without a struggle. When the pandemics have subsided, we will experience a new normal. God is doing a new thing. Moreover, Peter had an image of who the Messiah was and how the Messiah would defeat the enemy. Peter had an idea of Jesus ruling and reigning, and it did not encompass suffering, dying, and resurrection. Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Yes, he called Peter Satan because for a moment, Satan was ruling Peter's thoughts. Peter had allowed his view of things to overtake the godly view of circumstances. God tells us in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 9, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Disciples are not to guide and protect Jesus. They are to follow. Jesus is our guide and our protector. Jesus explains to the disciples and the crowd, there are three conditions of being a disciple. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. To deny self is to turn away from self-centeredness and idolatry. You, you probably would disapprove of a life-size gold statue if you deny yourself. It brought to mind the golden image Nebuchadnezzar had built and every time you heard a musical instrument, you would have bowed down to the golden image. Ultimately, you were thrown in a fiery furnace if you did not bow down to this golden statue. But if you deny yourself, you won't bow down to a golden statue. And you won't even allow a golden statue to be made of yourself in your likeness and image. No, when you... I sold out to the Lord. You would take up your cross. And to take up your cross is to take up God's will and God's way. You see, convicted criminals had to demonstrate their submission to the Roman government by carrying part of the cross through the city to their place of execution. Thus, you publicly demonstrated your submission, your obedience to the authority which you had rebelled. If you want to be a disciple of Christ, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Jesus. Say no to self and yes to God. Follow Jesus. So you want to be a disciple, witness and follow Jesus faithfully. We have to leave our old allegiances behind and follow Jesus. Follow the way Jesus has chosen for us, not the course of our choosing. We are told in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. If you try and save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for the sake of the gospel in Jesus, you will gain eternal life. What good is it to have all the riches in the world and have not received Jesus into your life? What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? We can give nothing for our souls. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory and with the holy angels. If we are ashamed of Jesus now, 
If we reject Jesus now, then when Jesus comes to rule and reign, Jesus will be ashamed of us and will not claim us as his own. We have to be willing to accept suffering and death as an integral portion of being a disciple. Some of you are saying, I didn't sign up for that. Yes, you did. You may not have understood it that way. Some of you signed up for eternal life, streets paved with gold, no more crying, no more pain, and no more suffering. These benefits are after you die. We signed up to be Christ-like in our thoughts and actions, to be witnesses and followers of Jesus. Being a disciple is a demanding job. When people see us, they should know that we are trying to be Christ-like in all our ways. It's not easy, but it is enriching. You will notice that the spectators dropped off. In John uh, chapter 6, verse 66, it says, From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Those not serious about being a disciple said, I'm out, I'm gone, this is it, I'm done. The work is all divine in that you are changing the world for a better place. Choose to follow, to serve, and to witness for Jesus Christ and do your part in making this a more equitable and safe world. Get involved. Speak up for justice. Do your civic duty and vote. Help a candidate. Be a candidate. Join a task force. Work to eliminate health disparities. You can be part of criminal justice reform. You can make access to housing fair. Be part of landlords doing right by their tenants and help our school system. There is much work to be done in the world. Be part of the change that you want to see. No, God is not a Republican or a Democrat. Let me say that again. God is not a Republican or a Democrat. But God is on the side of justice, fairness, the oppressed, and eliminating poverty and systemic racism. Join the work that God is involved with and make a change for the better. The doors of the church are open. Today is your day to say yes to God's will and way. Say yes to changing the world for the better. Say yes to brightening the corner where you are. The doors of the church are opening. Open, you may invite Jesus Christ into your life. You may join Wayman AME Church this morning. Raise your hand and we will respond. Praise the Lord. Yes, the demands of discipleship. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Blessings.
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Welcome to Wayman African Methodist Episcopal Church Virtual Worship. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Hallelujah. Glory to the name of our God. Bless the name of Jesus this morning. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. 